it's not even that you don't understand real estate some of these brand right. new folks that are coming in that i'm talking to anyways you don't even understand basic supply and demand you haven't even like taken an economics 101 course you don't have to go to college you could take one on youtube you haven't read an economics book if you are in real estate lending finance inspections and you are not getting your weekly knowledge dose you are doing yourself and your clients a disservice this is the knowledge brokers podcast i am not tom tool he is not with us today uh still on his beach home vacationing week i am byron lazine along with lisa chinati lisa welcome back to the pod after your worldly travels to go see taylor swift in milan or wherever you were celebrating <laughs> with the swifties i was living life with the swifties in italy and it was an experience i will never forget was it a like an A plus experience? Would you recommend everybody to going to a Swifty concert or? Uh, I mean, my child would rate it an A plus experience. I <laughs> still say it's an experience. Um, I'm glad I did it once. I don't know that I need to do it again. Which concert? We went to Billy Joel in 2019 in Madison Square yep. Garden. Obviously, the place to see Billy, Billy Joel. I mean, you saw now Taylor Swift in Italy. Which one? Do, do you enjoy better? Not because obviously taking aside, you've, you enjoyed Taylor Swift better because your family was there, but concert wise. So Taylor is theatrical like nobody else. And the performance that she puts on is epic. Um, there's a reason that she sells out stadiums at the level that she does. I think my kid will kill me because I don't know all the details, but she's done over a hundred concerts in this one tour and she has sold out every single one. And, and we're talking stadiums of 70, 80,000 people it's completely crazy. sold out. Um, so I think you have to give Taylor the win on the actual concert. Taylor gets the nod. All right. Last week, um, Lisa, we had our good friend, Jill Biggs, on the pod. She did incredible. We'll have her back because you were pretty bummed to miss I was, I was chatting with her this morning and I was saying I was so jealous, like that I wasn't a part of it. So Jill did great. I think everybody loved having Jill on. All right. It's been a crazy week. Uh, it was a good week for you to be out of America, by the way. Um, crazy week, obviously across the world, a lot has happened from last week to this week. Honestly, Lisa, yeah. I feel like the world has aged a hundred years in seven days. That's how much news it's like. We're I think Elon's right. We're living through a simulation right now. You can't write this stuff. And today we're going to talk about um, some stuff that came out in our world, real estate with the CFA, Consumer Federation of America. Uh, they've been coming out with a lot as of late. Um, what's going on with the California MLS General Counsel? Very strong comments on forms. We're now inside of 30 days from August 17th. California is one of the few states that's actually publishing uh, real-time edits on their forms. But the MLS general counsel really has some strong opinions on what should be and shouldn't be in those forms. And then interestingly enough, we've got some data from Relatix on agent count. And you're going to be, I think, surprised on where agent count is heading. So first, we're going to go CFA. Lisa, before we do that, we we record this Friday mornings and whenever we release same day, um, once the BAM team, Haley's uh, doing the edits here today for Bobby, once Knowledge Brokers gets published, it's usually about a couple hours after we record on Friday. So 10 a.m. It's right now, it's 10.15 East Coast time. And in real time, I know a bunch of you guys are waking up to it. There's this global tech outage that's hit airlines, businesses, emergency services all across the country. Banks. Yeah, it's, it's a Banks. It's broad. Yeah, I guess people couldn't get access to their banking. Actually, when my wife said that when I was leaving the house, she's like, oh my gosh, my mom can't get um, something done with her banking. I immediately went to the Bank of America ATM and pulled out cash just in case this was the end, Lisa. I'm like, I'll take a little more cash. I'll smoke a couple more cigars today if that's the case, if it's all ending. So the reason why I want to bring it up, I want to get your quick thoughts on this, then we're going to move on to our agenda. But we're so, I know you're focused on building in a lot of, tech forward support into you already have uh you're well advanced ahead of most people in the way you have uh your business set up but even further in the future on 
you know, really integrating AI and, you know, tr you know, trying to get an administrative staffs um, within the team and the company, the tools that they need to be even more efficient, uh, to be able to offer out another level of service uh, because the back end is taken care of. We can be more, uh, you know, consumer facing because everything on the back end is working. How does days like this make you think about going more and more tech heavy? Well, it's it's interesting. So I'm going to go back a little bit further. Remember when uh, Tom was part of that Boomtown outage? Um, yeah. That was a couple of months ago, right? And maybe two or three weeks ago, Real Geeks had an outage of sorts. And it was not a full day, but it was it was the better part of the day. We woke up and there was no access to the CRM. Um, and it was panic. Um, well, first my head went to the same thing is happening to Real Geeks that happened to Boomtown, right? Um, it's not knowing how long it's going to be down and also recognizing that we're so tied into it that like kind of putting in place the backup plans that we do have to try to keep business going was interesting. So I think one of the things that, that I'm super cognizant of is that I think we all need more backup plans. Um, I think that that's definitely part of it. I think it's also looking at it and I don't know, some aspect of it needs to not be tied all into tech, but um, it definitely gives you pause, right? Like if today's like travel banks, like the world is at some kind of level at a, at a standstill, which is a scary place to be. I just got off before we jumped into this recording off of our local radio show in Connecticut and our, uh, the mortgage lender who's, who joined me on the show, he said his system was down to lock in a rate and to do a mortgage application so he actually has to do the application. He's got to get it in, you know, uh, at 10 o'clock. He's printing it out and doing it by hand. Uh, and then he's going to send it into somewhere. So uh, systems are down across the board. And being able to not only have backups, but mm -hmm. he's like, I, he's like, I haven't done one pen and ink. And I don't remember. He's been in the business, I think, 22 years or something like that. Uh, but being able to go backwards and know you know, the old school way of doing it. Right. Yep. I mostly listen to audio books, but, uh, I can, I can barely read, but I could muscle through one. If I had to, if the audio books were down, Lisa, I could go backwards and get the, the actual hard copy. Okay. Well, um, I think there's a difference between the pen and income paper and contracts, which we can all do, but then the technology of your entire database, who to call, when to call that, uh, that's the trickier part to move out of a digital tech based world. Remember Rolodexes? Absolutely. You might be too young for Rolodexes. Yeah, the little things on the desk. Yeah, that spin. Yeah. I never had one, by the way. <laughs> that would be insane. But yes, <laughs> I know. I've seen the, the first office I ever worked in in Mystic, Connecticut. Um, it was a guy. I'll just his name was John. I won't give the last name, but he he had one on his desk. Um, you know, he was he was kind of checking out. This was 2011 ish, and he was, you know. Maybe That's a late to have a Rolodex. Like I, I was thinking more like, I don't know. Like I remember when I was in high school, if we would have flashcards or whatever in a, a plastic box and you could sort your flashcards, not quite a Rolodex, right? But those little three by five index well, cards. It was very late, but he didn't want to give up on it, you know, and, and okay. paper files and all these things. So, um, you know, I'd never, you know, 2011, 2012, 13, I didn't do paper file. I mean, I guess I did hand in a lot of paper still in those years to the, um, you know, coordinator in the office, but I never really kept a paper file. I, I had Dropbox, I think even back then or very, probably by 2013, I had Dropbox. Okay. I can't imagine I was doing too many paper files. I was still having paper signed for sure, but yeah. I was always scanning in. And if the office wanted paper, I'd give it to them. But I wasn't holding and filing paper ever in my career because I would just put it on the computer. Now, the office has, had a copy, so that was my backup, I guess, was the office having a copy. All right, well, crazy day. I mean, that that's obviously going to be an ongoing story. I did want to bring it up um, because, I, you know, I keep thinking moving forward, AI, being, being yep. like really cutting edge on that stuff. But there is value to also having a team around you that can adapt quickly in times like this 
uh, we're not impacted here by anything, but there's a lot of businesses across the country that are, and you made a great point, obviously, with Tom being impacted. All right. Uh, the Consumer Watchdog, the CFA, Consumer Federation of America, uh, continues to watch out on what's happening with the settlement and specifically evaluating home buyer contract forms. Okay. Yep. So they've commented on California's forms. California came out with a June release, a July release. Um, their July listing release, I spoke about it on the Real Word podcast. They changed it from June and they took out completely the optional concession field on their listings. Consumer Federation of America applauded them for that, said they still need to go further and they keep pushing them, go further and further um, to make a, a contract that what they believe would be consumer friendly. So the CFA criteria for readable and understandable forms would be length. The contract should be written solely for home purchasers, excluding renters. It should not include marginal provisions designed solely to protect the interest of the broker. And the agency agreement should be in a separate document. Uh, type size, most courts recommend 12 point. Any smaller would be difficult for people to read. Uh, CFA also says organization, the most important information, including compensation arrangements, arrangements should be at the beginning of the document and clearly labeled. It's one of the reasons I was critical of California's June release of their buyer agreement, Lisa, because they had 24 different sections, lines, or paragraphs regarding compensation, and it was scattered throughout a uh, multiple page document. So talk about organization. Why can't you have compensation in one section and move on? Why do I have to refer from 14A, go back to 4D, and I'm bouncing all around this document? It was crazy. They haven't updated their buyer one yet. And then plain language, the contract should be written so that it can be understood by home buyers. It should not contain words and language that can be understood only by lawyers. I've got a question for you on that particular part. Um, Lisa, cause you, you're pretty, um, you're pretty, you're a broker and you're pretty aware of how to write a great contract. You have to write, uh, you know, contracts for your brokerage. Um, you were obviously at work with an attorney on that. Um, so what's your reaction to their criteria? And then, um, and then I want to ask you a little bit about the language in contracts. Uh, so I think it's fair. I, I think that what they're trying to do is make it fair and easy for consumers and keep it consumer friendly, right? I think a lot of the feedback that we've heard um, is that the goal is to make it so that cons there's transparency for consumers. So I think that that's absolutely um, imperative. And I've looked at a bunch of different contracts that have been written by realtor associations at the state level um, for a couple of different states. I've been working with my attorney since, goodness, since March to kind of come up with our own specific contracts for our company, kind of outside of what Massachusetts and New Hampshire are putting out. And it's been an evolution and a journey. Um, and as we get there, it's... It, you know, I think the, the font maybe is getting a little bit nitpicky at 12 point font, but I understand the, the premise that they want it to be easy for the consumers to read. I agree that the California one was way too complicated and made it way too hard. Um, but the rest of it, I think agents should expect there should be dates. It should be uh, the termination clause should be understood and, and fair. Um, I think that there's certain sections that should be highlighted, underlined, bolded, whatever it is, so that the consumer is put on notice, not just to put the consumer on notice, but also to protect agents. Because I think what I'm cognizant of, and I think you probably are as well, is that there's probably going to be some sort of litigation that comes in the future because of these contracts as they get tested and tried. Um, I think one, I don't know if you mentioned it, I didn't hear it, but um, there's another part in here that said buyers should not be required to go into mediation or arbitration if there's a dispute, which was an interesting addition to put into that. Um, I do agree that seller concession should go to the buyers, not the brokers, and that the buyers should use it how they see fit. Whether And I think that that was spelled out by the settlement, right? That if the if the buyer brokerage contract isn't for the amount that the seller is willing to offer, that it, it, the agent doesn't get compensated anymore. And I think the way to protect it for the buyer to get the full benefit of it is to allow it to go towards concessions, towards closing costs or whatever. What are your I thoughts? Got 
well, here's the thing. I got um, beat up in the comments a little bit on Real World by one, a lot of, there okay. was overwhelming uh, California agents that were in agreement that this buyer uh, representation agreement was very unreadable. So that's the overwhelming mm -hmm. response throughout the industry, not just from the Consumer Federation of America, but there was one particular commenter from um, the Bay Area. And, you know, he went on uh, a comment rant saying, um, you know, if you don't understand it, that's your problem. It's your job to understand this contract. No, 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 no. It's not my job to understand mm -hmm. attorney lingo. Okay, Correct. I'm not I'm not here um, to give legal counsel as a yeah. real estate agent. It's not the job of a real estate agent. Y your job as a real estate agent is to do all the shit work between somebody who wants to buy a home and their journey of deciding I want to buy a home and actually getting the home. It's the work that they need off their plate because they need a professional in their corner to handle it to know the ins and the outs of what's the right step to take now. And because yep. number two, when I say shit work is they don't have the time. They have a job. They have a family. They have things that they're doing while they're trying to accomplish uh, this big purchase. So it's not the job of the attorney to try to get a law degree or of the agent rather to try to get a law degree. And this, some of the language in here was really confusing. The form was all over the place on um, on a lot of this uh, compensation fields. Now, they've updated the listing agreement. We're going to get into that here in, in a minute. But before we, we do that, I want just your thoughts on what's the fine line between putting in some of that aggressive attorney speak, um, you know, for protection for both brokers, obviously you being a broker and, and uh, consumers, and then having something that's simple and understandable. Uh, so I have gone the route of simple and understandable. Our uh, buyer brokerage agreements that we've designed with our attorney are a page and three quarters. Um, so it's not even two full pages. And here's the deal. Uh, I don't know. Uh, so I do think I was reading, was I maybe lab code agents or something the other day? And there was a post about something and an agent said, I've now feel like I've become a collection agency trying to collect a fee from a buyer because it didn't get put on at the at the closing and I didn't get paid. And so I do believe that there will be some need to enforce these contracts in some situations and a move forward. Um, but I also don't see a world where the agents are going to be out doing consumers in mass. Um, and I, I, so rare situations, but I think at the heart of it, if everybody understands what it says, the, the purpose of a, of a contract or agreement is to make sure both parties are on the same page. And if the agent is upholding their responsibility and doing their job and the buyer buys the property, then yes, the agent should get paid. And my gut says that the legal ease is more designed to protect against the, what's the, the word that I'm looking for? The not normal situations, right? Like the um, outlying situations that kind of shake out when using the agreement one of the things to your point that we actually put in ours and it is bolded, underlined, and italicized is that the agents are not acting as lawyers, appraisers, or any other professionals, and that that's not their obligation or their responsibility throughout the course of the transaction. So, well, Lisa, what's your take on cancellation? So, the EXP form, which is in the EXP toolkit online, EXP. For national brokerages, I would say, um, much like we've applauded Realtor.com for their buyer toolkit that they have published publicly online, um, EXP has put a toolkit published online for anybody to go look at, anybody to download their form. It's a two-page form. It's very simple to understand. I haven't seen many national brokerages take this level of transparency. I said it on the real word, and I'll say it here. I have beat up on a lot of things um, EXP. I'm not EXP. I'm not EXP propaganda. I'm commenting here on their buyer toolkit, which I think is pretty well done. Um, their uh, cancellation policy is this in their buyer agreement. Either party may cancel this agreement effective upon delivery of written notice to the other party unless buyer is under contract to purchase the property. 
That's it. It's one sentence. Anybody can cancel written notice unless under contract on a property. Very straightforward to me, very simple. And yep. that one that one cancellation um, line, line item number nine on their particular form, to me is a, it makes everything else in the contract not I, not irrelevant, but it makes it so straightforward and easy. It's like, hey, it's if I'm doing a good job and I'm holding up my promises, you, there's not going to be any reason to fire me. If if everything that I pitched mm -hmm. when I interviewed for the position of earning the right to represent you in this transaction, be your agent, be your buyer agent, then you won't fire me. If I'm falling through, falling short, then you're going to give me written notice and fire me. And everything else at that point doesn't really carry as much weight when you have a cancellation policy. Uh, do you like it or hate it? No, I... Uh... So I think that they should be cancelable. I I believe that the, con the the agent should continually be earning the business. But we've gone down the path of a non-exclusive and an exclusive. What I think should be there is a, a if I show you the house and I do the job right and I do that aspect of it. What shouldn't happen is that the consumer can then circumvent me to find somebody who will write the contract at a lower price. Right. Right. That I believe should not be cancelable. If I've done the work to find you the property that you end up buying, I show you the property that you end up purchasing, I should get paid or the agent should get paid for doing that work. But I show you 10 properties, you don't write any offers. I show you five properties and you write three offers and then get accepted. You should be able to cancel the contract and move on to a different agent who suits your needs at that point. Um, that's, that's my belief. So there, there's a gray area between maybe what the CXP document has where it's like, uh, you could circumvent this. And I was the procuring, I worked on the deal. I got you all the information. I handled the initial negotiations. Now somebody's nodding, you know, elbowing you over here and saying, Hey, uh, I can do this, write the contract for you. You could save a few bucks. Um, or, or maybe it would help with your negotiation even further. And yep. then they jump ship at the last minute and there should be some clarification on that um, because this doesn't appear to um, address that. So, so great point there. Okay. Yeah. I think uh, the, the interesting part will be, so imagine a world where you've got a contract signed at um, a, a percentage and I don't want to throw out percentages because we're not supposed to talk about those, but you've got a contract signed at a certain number and buyer submits the offer, you're negotiating, but you can't get to the point where the value of that contract is taken into account with the offer, right? And the, the buyer would have to bring extra money or increase their offer and it doesn't come together. Where I think we're going to run into some trouble is when the buyer then finds another agent who says, I'll do it for the amount that the seller would agree to compensate or whatever, and where it gets the buyer into the home. And that's going to be where there's going to be a little bit of, of finagling and trickiness that shakes out, right? I, I think it's going to be lesser for the where the, the case is that the you show the property, the buyer decides they want to buy it, and they go and find, remember um, Redfin? I'm sure you guys used to get these objections as well, where you'd show the house, write the offer, and then or show the house, buyer says, I want to write an offer, but... Um, you know, I, I want a percentage of the commission back. And if you don't agree to do it, I'll go to Redfin because they'll just give me a percentage of the commission back. Um, and I, I can see a world where that kind of shakes out a little bit, but my gut says not as much. I think that there'll be some level of loyalty once the contract is inked. And, and you earn the level of loyalty and mm -hmm. you, you, you ink a contract. Our, our good friend and mentor, Tom Ferry put out uh, I thought a really strong message on Instagram, I think it was yesterday, in fact, where uh, he's encouraging buyer agents to, for for any of us who have been, you know, had a lot of listings and managed a lot of listings in our career, we know the value of a weekly call set up with our seller. 
And yeah. I used to call it the communication guarantee. And in fact, I guaranteed my communication to the level of making the listing contract cancelable on any week I miss my communication guarantee. Listing contracts are typically not as freely cancelable as a buyer contract because of the um, investment that goes up front, of course. But I would make mine cancelable just based on my communication, my weekly calls and a couple other different updates, traffic and marketing updates that I would supply to every single seller, okay? Tom was talking about, hey, that's a call that needs to you know, take place and be on the calendar with your buyers, okay? Mm -hmm. If we're under contract and we have a game plan here, next 60, 90 days, what, what's the strategy? What are you doing for me on a weekly basis to really untap off-market and on-market opportunities for me so that we can get into the right position on my buy side? Not, not enough agents, I think, would be willing. They're waiting to have text message conversations based on a listing link coming to them from the buyer. Where you set up a strategy call and here's what we've, we've done. Here are the approaches that we're taking here to uncover more properties for you. Why would they cancel that contract? So I think knowledge brokers are going to take that type of approach to their buy side where they're really treating it just as they would um, any of the listings in their business. Yeah, I did a podcast with uh, Tom Ferry and Jack Miller from T360. I think it came out this week, actually. And that was Tom's video this week was a spinoff of what we talked about on that podcast, which was exactly that. The We have the, I think it was uh, Jimmy Mackin, who's phrased it, the don't fire me report for sellers. Yeah. And then Tom brought it up on this podcast that uh, exactly what you're saying, buyer agents need to look at creating, inventing whatever it's going to look like for a don't fire me report for their buyers in their buyer agency contracts. Don't fire me report is kind of like realtor lingo, Jimmy, but <laughs> Jimmy's a good friend. I love you, Jimmy. Uh, I would publicly market that as your communication guarantee. Um, <laughs> yes, that's course. how, that's how I market it. But anyways, the, you know, if you sit down with like an EOS implementer or somebody who's going to really look at your business um, they're going to ask you the question, what what do you guarantee to the market that's yep. different than your competitors? Or just plainly and simply, what guarantees are you making to your customers that you're yep. standing solely behind? And you could put these types of guarantees, these just simple like strategy, sweat equity, I'm organized, I'm ready to go, plans, communication guarantee on both sides with buyer and seller, you can come up with a little bit of a different name if you don't like communication, but um, it actually speaks a lot to this consumer federation checklist that they're sending out to consumers saying, hey, these are the things that you should be aware of. One of them is organization. Okay, they're talking about organization on the, of the forms and the arrangements. How about the organization around the plan that you present to buyers and sellers on how you're gonna work with them? Here's some more from CFA, and then we'll move over to some of these comments from the California uh, MLS general counsel, uh, as it relates to listing contracts, but, uh, CFA's criteria to ensure fairness to home buyers, again, length of contract termination, compensation, disclosure, compensation, commission, compensation, fees, compensation, when owed compensation, continuing obligation, seller concessions, dual agency, conflict of interest, better buyer remedies. The consumer federation has also put out press releases where they're encouraging home buyers to negotiate commission um, as they should open an, uh, a fair and open negotiation to understand what that compensation is going to be, how, how it's going to be paid, all of that. Um, they're also encouraging them to, uh, you know, certainly if they have any questions on the form, not to go back to the agent and ask those questions, but if they have questions where it's like not understandable to present it to their attorney. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, I'll tell you what that'll open up right now. You're going to see attorney firms that are going to say, we'll represent you. Okay. If you're coming to me with the questions about your form, why don't I just handle the deal on the buy side for you? I'll be your counsel. I'm going to do the closing anyways. You will see an uptick in uh, attorneys try to take, um, take that on. I'm not saying they're going to get out of their office and do anything in the field that we know buyers uh, want and need. 
but I'm just saying th there's going to be that, um, that's going to be a business model that's, that gets out there a little bit. Do you agree with that, Lisa? A hundred percent. Yep. All right. Ed Zorn has been kind of all over the news here with some of this California stuff. Uh, and he says to the real estate industry, according to Inman, get rid of commission sharing now. Okay. He went as far as saying that the listing agreements, Lisa, should not even have the optionality for the seller to include concessions as a percentage of the commission uh, being offered out. He doesn't want listing agreements to share that. Now, California has a uh, an MLS addendum. So their listing agreement that they've shown in July with, with a bunch of red ink and changes doesn't have it. Their addendum, their MLS addendum two pager does say that the seller can can offer concessions, but doesn't have anywhere to write it in on that MLS form, what it would be. And his belief being the general counsel of the MLS is there shouldn't be an amount on the MLS. So he wants to restrict um, the options that sellers have available to them. What do you think about this? Oh, gives me heartache, like heartburn. I, I I don't know how it's going to shake out, but it, it's it's a slippery territory, right? It, it's at the end of the day, the DOJ wants the commissions completely out of the sellers being able to offer. But the same thing that we've been talking about, as you see inventory increase, I think it's it's going to cripple sellers who are in a position where they need to sell their homes in those markets where. There's an like an overabundance of inventory. Sometimes that's going to be something that they want to do in order to help their home sell. And I, I think it can. I, I get why they are saying it at one level, but I think it's going to create a whole host of problems in another level. It, less clear contracts. It's going to open up more room for miscommunications around that, and then just trouble selling properties. California. Um board and California MLS um, has championed themselves as being leaders of getting ahead of things. And what they're alluding to is when they say getting ahead of things and taking this concession opportunity for sellers out of the contracts altogether, they're saying we're, they're getting ahead of what you alluded to, which is the DOJ wanting this. And yep. they're saying, oh, the DOJ is going to get their way. I asked Sam DiBianchi, who's a, she owns her own brokerage down in Fort Lauderdale. Um, she's had it since 2012, been an agent since 2009. She appears on Fox Business um, regularly and CNBC, other um, mainstream media outlets to educate consumers on real estate. She was on Bravo, uh, Million Dollar Listing in Miami back in the day, all that kind of stuff. Anyways, I said to Sam, I said, when we were having this discussion on the BAM barbecue this week, I said, wouldn't you just... If you were NAR, wouldn't you put all your efforts and these local boards right now behind stalling as much as you can, knowing that come post November 5, there's a at least coin flip. A lot of polls are showing a little bit greater than a coin flip chance yeah. of there being a new mindset within the DOJ. Her opinion was no. She's like, I'd move forward now. And it's been the NAR stance, like, let's just bite the bullet. And this is what the DOJ wants. Let's give it to them. I, I completely disagree. Uh, I think that we're rushing into August 17th. I don't see um, anything from my state. Um, and I see stuff from Florida. I haven't seen anything in Florida that's really that. Uh, and, she, you know, she's in Florida. She said, you know, there's there's still uncertainty there. So California, they still have a bunch of red ink and they're getting shredded all over the industry by brokers and agents and all kinds of, you know, publications, notorious ROB substack. So even the stuff that we have seen doesn't appear ready for August 17th, that actual settlement, August 17th, you know, NAR implementing and local boards following, um, that's ahead of when the settlement actually gets, uh, finalized. The yeah. judge doesn't finalize the settlement until November. I look at the, okay, the judge isn't finalizing until November. We're pushing the August 17th back date. If it's me, I'm putting resources behind that. Um, and I'm going to wait until November. And I'm just going to, you know what? I'm going to just 
frankly, hope we can get a new DOJ in there. We already have a plan that is uh, very restrictive with the settlement. You know, the settlement obviously isn't going to change. The, the issue is the DOJ wants to go further. And to me, the DOJ wants to restrict business, which ultimately hurts options for consumers. Yep. The DOJ has shown their cards for three and a half years now in restricting businesses, not just in real estate, but across the board. It's why M&As are down. It's why if you go back to the state of California, you've got the tech community um, wanting this DOJ out because they want to do mergers and acquisitions. They want business open as usual. And so where do you stand on that? Obviously, Sam has her opinion. Let's just bite the bullet. Let's move forward. That's a valuable um, insight from her. I would try to delay because I don't think we're ready anyways. I haven't seen any indication from the industry um, that they that we are ready for an August 17th implementation. By the way, we're I mean, we're a buyer agency state and we're already having the signs formed ahead of time. We've been doing it for months. Uh, I'm acting on the premise of the settlement. My point is, um, before all these forms get finalized, it's a moving situation and there's going to be a little bit of a gray area. Why not just try to see what happens in November? What's your take? Well, so I think what I'll, I'll say first, I think a lot of states haven't put out forms because they're afraid of falling into the same trap that California has fallen into. And I think that they're afraid of the publicity and the constantly having to redline and change. So I think that that's one. I think waiting. So New Hampshire, we July 15th, we rolled out. We have no compensation offered in any of our New Hampshire listings right now. So we have to have contracts on the buyer side totally implemented and having it spelled out because there is legitimately no offers of compensation anywhere in New Hampshire right now. I think the listing contracts, I tend to agree with you in a certain level. Um, I think it's I think it's going to be tricky to to implement any of the changes on the listing contract now partly because in states where compensation is still being offered in MLS I I think it might be it to the seller's detriment to not have compensation offered right now or at least not spell it out or be the odd man out right it's going to create a gray area Massachusetts is rolling out the option to um in their fields they'll say Compensation is offered, compensation not offered, or compensation will be offered but not posted in the MLS. So really working with some gray areas there as well. Um, I, I, I agree coin flip on what changes with the DOJ, probably more, um, I'm with you. I think we know where it's gonna end up um, with respect to the election. I don't know that it changes the DOJ. <clears throat> we had a DOJ that um, actually settled with NAR, uh, I know. former administration, and then this administration, they backed out <clears throat> of the settlement, and they were, they've been, this DOJ, at least the last three and a half years, you just got to call it down the middle, they have been very aggressive on uh, businesses. I agree with the, that. It's been a, a mandate. Across from, the board. Yep. From day one. Yeah, so, I, I agree. I just, I don't. How would it change quickly enough and with the, the mindset shift that I think that's the word that you used, right? A mindset shift. Would that happen quickly enough to stop the train that's already in motion? I don't know that it does. Yeah. I mean, cause you have to wait till the end of January and, and what, you know, what is most important for the current DOJ? Cause listen, if there's a, a change in the white house, um, the current uh, DOJ they had to do, they're getting fired. I mean, that's already, that's going to be clear if you, you get a transition there. But now what are, what's going to be most important to the DOJ to try to push through pre whatever right. it is, January 20 something, you know, January, whatever the date would be. Um, you know, and, and historically you get these next few months, you know, in election year, you kind of have like a lame duck situation where not too many things happen. Uh, with where we are in this country, I can imagine them trying to do a lot of <laughs> work, um, you know, and, and, you know, trying to make it harder on the next administration to unwind some of it. So, um, you know, I think, listen, I think if the DOJ would honor um, what plaintiffs have agreed to and what is being projected that a judge is going to finalize in November, if the DOJ says, hey, 
And it's very much in line with the first settlement that they agreed to. This seems to be a consensus here. If the DOJ would honor that, then I'd say, yeah, go ahead and finalize, get the appropriate forms out, move forward right now. Um, If the DOJ wants to go further and take incentives away, I mean, they've said crazy things like put agents on an hourly salary and that that's I don't see that happening. I I, I don't see any universe where that happens. When I say we need a new mindset in the DOJ, these are things that come out of their mouth. These are probably smart people, but they're saying really dumb things. They obviously don't understand um, sales and sales incentives work across the board. Why is... um, why are there national home builders? I have it on my Twitter at Byron Lozine uh, on X. Why are there national home builders right now offering 8% commissions to buyer agents? Well, because they know that sales incentives work to drive attention to their property. What do they need when they've, they're selling a product that's lacking traffic? They need more eyeballs. They need more traffic. They need another spin. Right. They need another marketing angle. They're doing that incentive in a market like this in certain locations where inventory is up to drive attention up. They didn't offer 8%. This is why you know commissions are so freaking negotiable. It's not even funny. They didn't offer 8% in 2001. It, traffic was flowing like a river through their communities. Like it, it was all day long they had traffic, so they weren't offering 8%. There's a balance in the market that has to be met, um, and they're meeting the imbalance of, of traffic right now. So. Um, well, that's Going my point f- with saying that it, uh, if we take away the seller's ability to offer that, it could be it could be handicapping sellers. Yeah, you're restricting sellers. The best argument I've heard is, do sellers have any rights on what they want to articulate to the market? Are you restricting their speech and their ability to market the property in the way that they want to uh, market? That I mean, that is a constitutional right, freedom of speech. And so you can't, you can't stop it, um, but right. the, you know they're trying to take it out of forms and all of this kind of stuff. And so you're just making it harder and harder and harder for sellers to ultimately do. If that's the strategy that they choose, um, you know you're making it harder on them. There's also concerns that Ed Zorn did um, acknowledge. National Association of Hispanic uh, Real Estate Professionals have big concerns with taking. Um, offers of compensation out uh, because they are petrified about the, this is reading right from Inman, they're petrified about the commissions coming out of the MLS because they know their body of people are going to be too scared to buy houses um, with not having certainty around, okay, I might have to, I might have to do this. Like there could be three different ways and I just want to buy a home for me and my family. So by the way, uh, National Association of Hispanic Real Estate Professionals. Um, Gary Acosta, the leader, is incredible. He's very, very organized, uh, professional, and that is probably the best association I've seen uh, in real estate right now. Very, very strong association. So uh, I would value their opinion there. All right, uh, Lisa, we've got one more topic here. Um, Relatix, uh, d- data company for uh, agents uh, to get data on other agents. Really, there it's, it's a I would call it a recruiting software or analytical software to brokers use to get information about what other agents are using. They uh, just released the Agent Movement a- Index (AMI) for June 2024, and uh, in this index, Lisa, surprisingly, we'll, we'll put the uh, chart up. Active agents. Right now, um, in June, uh, despite everybody's expectations that this number would fall, the number of active real estate agents is climbing, and it continues to climb, okay? Uh, There's uh, movement of agents between brokerages appears to be stabilizing, according to them. Um, Levels uh, observed prior to 2017, this suggests a return to more predictable and less volatile agent pool, at least for the time being. Uh, you have variations regionally, uh, differences in agent movement between major markets highlight the impact of local competitive factors. Relatix team will conduct in-depth market analysis analysis to uh, further understand these trends. Housing Wire just reported on this. We reported on some of um, now BAM did uh, in March and April on some of this Relatix data. And the trend, he, he said it back then, 
um, the CEO, uh, the founder, Rel Rel Relatix, Rob Keefe, who I did a phone call with about this, he said it back then, and now it is continuing an ongoing rise in active agents uh, and stabilization of agent movement uh, appear to be taking shape. Everybody thought agent count was going to go down. Why do you think it's going up? It's an interesting question. I, I don't necessarily know why it's going up, but I feel it going up based upon looking at the lists of um, folks who've been passing the real estate exam in Massachusetts and New Hampshire. I think maybe not as many are leaving as what was initially predicted while the like post pandemic kind of delays or backlogs, if you will, have, have shaken out. I, I, I don't know. It's, I find it fascinating. Um, I don't think I really thought that the counts of agents would plummet. I thought it would hold steady. I didn't, I didn't anticipate it would go up at the level that it appears to be going up. Yeah. I think when we did our over under on, when we were looking at NAR agent count, I had yeah. over, um, even on that, even knowing that you'd have agents stay in the business, but maybe drop out of NAR. Cause I just thought it was going to take a lot of time to work through the system. And so I didn't have that number going down, um, this year, but, um, to see that overall agent count is going up, that comes to a shock to many. Everybody's like, these changes are going to push people out of the industry. There's less transactions and, you're going to well, see and that's the other side of it. You're right. Transactions are down, which is the other fascinating part, right? Like, what are we still four, four, one, four, two for yeah. predicted for this year? Yep. Yeah, we're in the low fours. I mean, we're we're at a level that um, we haven't seen even you know based on population increases and all this. We haven't we haven't seen this in decades. Uh, even the great financial crisis was um, at the bottom. There was was basically at this level. So. We're really low on transaction count, um, which yeah. usually when you see that, you see agents getting out of the business and you see agents getting into the business. Now, I talk to a lot of brand new agents. Um, you know, we, we like to train brand new agents. And one of the things that is scaring the hell out of me when I have these conversations with new agents is they're like, hey, real estate really seems to be strong, seems like a great opportunity right now. And I'm like, uh, <laughs> You you are coming into the business with absolutely zero knowledge yeah. of what the heck the industry looks like. They have no information on everything we just talked about with the NAR settlement and how there is an absolute change and shift in the way business is being done right now. They don't even, it's like, oh, really? Oh, well, is that a big deal? You know, like, and then number two, they don't even understand that because all they're seeing is high prices, unaffordability. And it's like, wow, if I got X percent of that, that, that seems like a lot <laughs> of money. And it's like, hello, there's 30 or 40 percent less transactions, less sales happening. You don't even it's not even that you don't understand real estate. Some of these brand right. new folks that are coming in that I'm talking to anyways. You don't even understand basic supply and demand. You haven't even like taken an economics 101 course. You don't have to go to college. You could take one on YouTube. You haven't read an economics book. Um, right. And it's it's really scary to see the level for brand new, like people that are in licensing school right now, um, level of complete unawareness coming into the industry of what they're getting into. And... It, that's a scary thing. Now, it also comes from a place where people are certainly not happy with their current situation. And I think that speaks to there's a lot of um, Gen Z millennial that are like not happy with maybe the degree they just got, not happy with the current job they have, not current with the uh, outlook on the economy, their personal financial situation. We see that in a lot of the surveys. And so they're looking for what that next thing is. I just, I just have a concern that it's like, you see a 60 hour class, you see real estate. Oh, I think real estate agents make a lot of money. They don't, they make below the median, uh, income, uh, on, on the averages and they're not going the next step further. I mean, I had done so much re I had obviously personal experience buying three homes and, um, going through that entire process of bankruptcy in real estate before I got in. But I was also just a student of 
the game. I was I was looking locally at not only the market but the agent community. Um, I was studying and reading about real estate. I had a real level of uh, l real estate lingo and knowledge and connections before I even got my license. And if you really want to do it, why wouldn't you spend more time around it before you, you even get the license? What, so that's my concern, Lisa. Now, am I completely just coming at it from that? I think everybody should work hard and like tough butt uh, stance or where are you at? No, I, well, it's interesting. So much like you, we um, typically, I love to train brand new agents. I find them fun. I had an interview with a, a brand new agent last night who just got his license, super excited, um, really unrealistic about what was going to be required to jump into the industry. Also had absolutely no knowledge about the differences that were shaking out between what the industry was and what the industry is going to be in a few weeks. It's what I'll toss back is it's I, I, the fascinating part is that those that are brand new know nothing different, right? They, they know nothing different and often have no fear with presenting the contract and making the ask for the business on the buy side. The ones that are trained, right? That's a hundred percent true. Correct. Whereas some of the more experienced agents that you and I know are struggling to make the ask for buyer agency contracts at any level of compensation in there. Um, and so it, I think if we look forward in 24 months is when I think we're going to start to see some of the biggest impact 24 months after everything changes. And I suspect we're going to find a drop off in the longer tenured agents who can't adapt while an increase in the newer agents who find some opportunity in just not knowing the way that things used to be. I do believe that to your point though, there is a lot, I've said this over and over, HGTV and Netflix and all of those things have done the industry a disservice by making it look easy and like there's tons of money to be made and that it's glamorous and you know, whatever. But I do think that there is something that new brand new licensees who don't know the old way are going to bring to the table that is going to really challenge the tenured agents. I, I don't hold Bravo and, and Netflix responsible. Um, you know, just because the Kardashians made, um, you know, sitting around the house and making millions of dollars look easy, didn't give me some false premise that I could throw a video camera in my living room and start bullshitting with my family and make millions of dollars off of it and start all of these brands that the Kardashians did. It didn't give me like, oh, maybe I'll flip the camera on and, uh, you know, become a billionaire in the next couple of years. You know, it's just, I think we, we tend to say, well, Bravo and always gave a false premise. It's like, you know, when you're watching Bravo, you're Bravo, you're watching drama, you know, it's like, even when they, they sit down after those, uh, Bravo shows with that guy who's always on New Year's Eve with uh, with Cooper Anderson. What's his name? Um, I mean, they're sitting there doing shots. They're like, you know, it's a very dramatic I, trying to pick fights with people. I don't know. I I I think that it's had impact on the real estate side of things. I I'm I'm not saying it hasn't. I'm just saying people need to be smarter than that. Okay, people well, want to blame Facebook and Instagram and X for all of their their problems. It's like just be an adult. Be an adult. I'm I'm with you, but it, uh, I think that those those TV shows that we're talking about make it look like it's easy. Or easy easier. and lot and, and the one problem I would say is it makes it look like the agent is getting top line gross revenue mm -hmm. on six points and everybody in this industry knows most of those million dollar properties you know first of all they would only be getting half of that and it's not even that number the average mm -hmm. on those million dollar properties is 60 percent lower than that oftentimes and then they have a split and then oh by the way to market a million dollar listing uh, or 10 million dollar listing like some of these shows have you're talking about a you know multiple thousand dollar investment per month, and then oh again, do you pay taxes or not? And do you pay your employee? And there's just like all these fees and expenses that aren't even disclosed at all. So the numbers 
are very misleading. I, I'll 1000% agree with you there. Uh, all right, Lisa, anything else, uh, anything else on the agent stuff? I think that's kind of it. Um, no, I got to wrap cause we're past 11. Yeah. yeah. Let's wrap it up. Uh, Lisa, thanks for coming back. Appreciate you. I thought you'd, you'd, I thought you'd never come back, honestly. You'd, uh, you'd go to you Italy. know, I, I couldn't live in Europe. I'm, I'm, that can do it. I'm not meant to. You're just a mass girl. Originally from CT. People don't realize that about you. Yep. Well, it's all small states. We're all the same. That's right. All right. There you go. We'll hopefully have Tom back next week. Appreciate um, all of you guys' support. What's most important is what you think about all these topics. Let us know in the comments. We'll see you next week on Knowledge Brokers Pod. See you, Lisa. Peace. We know that in 2024, your business operations will be more important than ever. Once I figured this out, my business was able to scale and take off. See, generating leads is one thing, but getting that deal across the finish line while keeping everyone happy is another story. Enter Mosaic. Everything you need once a lead becomes a client. Mosaic picks up where CRMs leave off to streamline the client experience and maximize your productivity. It's the operating platform that gives agents and teams everything they need to stay organized and proactive throughout the entire transaction process and beyond. Transaction management, forms, AI-powered collaborative search, client retention capabilities, and advanced analytics for your business. In other words, you can use Mosaic to create a powerful flywheel for your business. It will help you close every deal, boost your profitability, and generate more repeat and referral business. If you need a better way to run your business, Check out the link below and learn how Mosaic can help you today. At BAMX, we listen to what real estate professionals want and need. That's why our platform is filled with sought after courses, content, and tactical assets for your business. And that's why we launched BAMX in a box with templates and scripts done for you, delivered each Friday. The best part? It's not coming from panel pontificators who bought their followers and don't sell any real estate. It's coming from top agents, team leaders, and content creators in the industry. It's education that actually shows you how to do what you need in today's market. And now it includes editable templates and scripts so you can easily deliver that knowledge to your database. Every day, we continue to add more content into BAMX, into our private Facebook community, content that works, content that our members have exclusive access to daily. Do not wait any longer. Use code KNOWLEDGEBROKERS and join the thousands of agents taking their business to the next level today. Use KNOWLEDGEBROKERS for 10% off. See you in BAMX.